Hi guys, it's me, Professor Dean. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, we're going to be doing a case study. All right, so we're gonna be going over patient prioritization. Before we get started, as always, I'm gonna ask you to please support me and support this channel. How? Liking this video, go ahead and give me a thumbs up so you don't forget, you're gonna love the video. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already www.nexusnursinginstitute.com. There you can sign up for a next generation NCLEX review session, part one and part two. You can sign up for audio lessons. You can sign up for private tutoring sessions or a consultation session. Maybe you just want to pick my brain about something. All of those can be found on my website. Almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics across my social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and of course, right here on YouTube, my handle is the same everywhere. So guys, without any further do, let's get started. Okay, guys, so we're going to be covering uh, patient prioritization. And if you are new to me going over case studies, I like to teach you how to think, okay? So when you have this case study, the first thing I always teach you to do is to just to go over the case study. Just read it. That's it. Read it one time and then read it a second time. But the second time that you're reading it, you need to draw uh, out all of the abnormalities. So anything that's abnormal, highlight it, underline it, put a star next to it, but do something so that it stands out to you. And the reason you're doing that is when you're put, you know, pointing out all of these abnormalities, a clinical picture presents itself to you. And so before you even get to the questions, you already have some sort of idea of what's going on with your patient, what kind of diagnostic tests or even orders you'd be expected for this patient and the type of nursing interventions you would expect for this patient simply by pulling out the abnormality. So that's what we're going to do here. So let's start. Here's a scenario. You're the nurse working on a day shift working the day shift on a medical surgical unit, you're assigned to care for four patients. It's 8 a.m. and you just received shift report. Your patients are as follows. So patient one, Sarah Johnson, 68 years old, diagnosis COPD, current status, patients on two liters of oxygen via nasal cannula, O2 sats 92%. She's dyspneic, um, anxious, respiratory rate 28 breaths per minute. Patient two, John Carter, 75 years old, uh, post-op day one for hip replacement Current status, patient reports eight out of 10 pain scale on surgical site, vital sign stable, has not received morning dose of pain medication. Patient three, Maria Lopez, 45 year old in DKA, blood glucose 350, receiving insulin drip, alert oriented, but reports nausea and pain. And last is James Miller, age 62, pneumonia with possible sepsis, current status, temp 102, Point four, heart rate 115, resp respirations 26, blood pressure 90 over, 60, 90 over 60, patients diaphoretic and appear confused. So the first question, it says, which patient should the nurse see first? Here are the options. Uh, Sarah, the COPD with, oh, it says 89, but that's a lie. It's not 89. It's not 89. It's not 89. Sarah with an O2 sat of 92%, John Carter, post-op hip replacement with pain, eight out of 10, Maria Lopez, that's in DKA and the glucose is 350, or James Miller that has pneumonia with possible sepsis and hypotension. Which patient are we going to see first? So um, I went, I did the question, but I didn't read the case study a second time my mistake. Let me go back and go over this case study a second time, but this time we're going to pull out the abnormalities. And look at the difference. Look how that's going to make more sense to you guys. Let me go back to the beginning and let's highlight all the abnormalities. So our first patient, the diagnosis is always going to be abnormal an abnormality. That's what's wrong with them. Okay. So the patient's got COPD. We don't know what kind, maybe they've got bronchitis, maybe they've got emphysema. We know they've got COPD. This is a chronic respiratory condition. Okay. They're on two liters. Their O2 sat is 92%. That's abnormal because it's supposed to be 95 to hundred. That's your normal O2 sat. Respirations are increased. I'm going to go and highlight that. Oh, can't forget about them being dysmic and anxious. Next, John Carter, 75. What's he coming in? One day post-op. I like that. That's what's wrong. Uh, pain, 8 out of 10. Hasn't got his meds yet, his pain meds. Maria Lopez, diagnosis is always going to be what's wrong. We're going to highlight that. 
Blood glucose is elevated. We're going to highlight that. Patients on insulin drip, alert and oriented, but up, oh, nausea and abdominal pain. We're highlighting that. Last is James Miller. Let's highlight what's going on with him. Pneumonia has got an infection of the lung with possible sepsis. This thing could have gotten in the bloodstream and it's all over. We're highlighting that. Increased temp. Increased heart rate. Increased respirations. Low blood pressure. Diaphoretic. Confused. Now, with what I just did, let's go back to this first question. Which patient are you going to see first? Sarah Johnson, John Carter, Maria Lopez, or James Miller? I think after going over this a second time and pulling out the abnormalities, I think most of you guys are going to go with James Miller. Patient number four, this is the patient that has pneumonia. They have a respiratory infection with possible sepsis. By the way, sepsis is life-threatening. And then... Oh, I thought I highlighted the temp. Let me go back. I thought I highlighted. Maybe I didn't. Anyway, look at this. Look at what's going on with this patient. Increased um, temperature, increased heart rate, increased respirations, decreased blood pressure. That patient's hypotensive. What do we think is happening? Yeah, that possible sepsis, most likely what's happening is this patient's septic. Okay, this is a life-threatening emergency. On top of that, patient's diaphoretic and appears confused. Let me tell you something. I've said this a million times. When it comes to priority patients, the minute you see a patient has a change in their level of consciousness, and it's not for the good, patients confused, patients lethargic, patients disoriented, anything that shows a change in level of consciousness that's not increased change of level of consciousness, it's actually decreased change in level of consciousness, that is always a red flag. Why? Because that change in level of consciousness lets us know something is severely wrong. Maybe they had a stroke. Maybe they're hypoxemic. Maybe they're bleeding out. Maybe they have a pulmonary embolism. We don't know, but we know something really, really bad. I'm telling you right now, change in LOC, that's, that's a red flag. Most likely that's going to be your priority patient. Now, I know a lot of you guys would have been stuck between one and four because we're looking at one. Let me go back up to number one. Sarah Johnson, she's she's got stuff going on with her respirations. Why do we choose four instead of one? Whenever we're talking about priority, we're talking about what's hurting the patient right now. Who is most likely, right? So between one and four, let's look at one. Patient's got COPD. What is COPD? This is a chronic condition. This isn't something that just developed yesterday, right? This is something that they've been living with. And I'm not saying that we don't care about it. What I'm saying is that when a patient has a chronic condition, their body has more compensatory mechanisms, right? With that being said, patients on two liters, O2 sats at 92. Well, that's not good. Normal O2 sat, o, I can't speak. Normal O2 sat is between 95 and 100. However, patients with COPD, tend to live and function on much lower O2 sats. Why? Because instead of breathing like a normal patient, they're holding on to all that carbon dioxide and they tend to be in a chronic uh, um, acidic state, right? So the fact that that patient's O2 sat is at 92, for a copd -er, this is not lethal, okay? Once you hit 91, you're at respiratory distress. A patient without any uh, respiratory condition, once you're at 91, you're at respiratory distress. But again, this is a copd -er. That's why you guys got to be careful. You can't try to act like a robot and put everything in a box. You have to use your critical thinking skills, right? If this was a patient that had no history of respiratory condition, they didn't have COPD, they didn't have bronchitis, they, didn't have they had none of that. And now we're seeing that they're O2 sats 92. We're seeing 28 breaths per minute. That would have been our priority patient. That's why you guys have to look at the whole clinical picture. Okay? So you should have narrowed it down to one and four, but four is going to be our priority. This patient, not only do they have pneumonia, which is a respiratory condition, an acute respiratory condition, now it's, it's most likely turned into sepsis looking at this um, picture of what's going on with them. That's who we're going to see first, and I explain to you guys why. When it comes to priority, you guys need to be looking at 
of course, abnormal vital signs. But when I say abnormal vital signs, if the patient's heart rate or respiratory rate is just one or two beats off, that's not deadly. And when I say abnormal, I mean deadly for the patient. Because again, we're looking at patient number one, Sarah Johnson, a regular patient with no respiratory condition, this would be deadly for them. This would have been our priority patient, but this patient has COPD, right? Not saying we don't care about them, but this is a chronic disorder where their O2 sats tend to be low. The respirations tend to be increased. So we're not, it's not like we're not going to check them. I'm just saying that that's not the first patient that we're going to check. Okay, somebody is worse off than them. And if our patient that has pneumonia and now going through sepsis, this patient is more likely to before that COPD. -er. Look at question number two. Let me move this up for you. Question number two, it says, after addressing the needs of uh, patient D, that was the patient that had pneumonia that was going into sepsis. After seeing that patient, which patient are you going to see next? Here are the options, the COPD or the one-day post-op, or the patient with DKA. Who do you think you're going to see second? I hope you said the COPD -er. That's who we're going to see second. And again, I thought I saved this. Guess not. But it says 89%. Really, I put 92. And the O2 sats, 92. Um, why are we going to see them next? Let's take a look. Dysmic, anxious, respiratory rate of 28 breaths. Like I said, it's a chronic condition. It's not that we don't care. It's just that we have somebody worse off. And again, you can't live without breathing, right? So you should have at least narrowed down your priority to number one and number four. Number four is going to be your biggest priority because they have um, trouble breathing. You can't live without breathing. And on top of that, sepsis right? Then immediately after that, we're going to go to Sarah Johnson. We're going to assess her and call the um, healthcare provider for any orders. Who would we see third? Because I think that's the next question. Yeah. The next question is who we're going to see third. Take a look at our patients. Between patient two, our one-day post-op, and patient three, our DKA, who do you think you're going to see first? DKA right? Why are we seeing our DK patient? Yes, they're on an insulin drip. Great. But guess what? They're experiencing nausea and abdominal pain. What does that let us know? That, that lets us know that the treatment for the DKA, DKA isn't as effective as we would like it, th as we would like it to be. This patient is still symptomatic. Now, remember, your patients that have DKA, they're going to be on an insulin drip. And then once we get that blood sugar down to about 250, guess what we're going to add? Glucose. Professor D, what are you talking about? Glucose, why would we do that? Because we don't want the blood sugar to drop too quickly. We'll mess around and cause our patient to have seizures, right? So anyway, back to this patient. We're seeing them next because... Um, the treatment of that insulin drip isn't as effective as we would need it to be because they're reporting nausea and abdominal pain. Last is the patient that's one day post-op. Let me tell you something. Any patient that just had surgery, our biggest concerns are going to be hemorrhage. So we're going to look for those signs and symptoms of them bleeding out. The second concern, and I'm not, it's not in any order. I'm just telling you the three concerns, um, pulmonary embolism and or DVT. So we'd be watching out for that. And of course, infection, right? Patients one day post-op. So after 24 hours, it's very likely that's when we'll start seeing the temp go up, increase CRP, WBCs, things like that. If that patient has an infection, but there's nothing about that. All it says is that they have eight out of 10 pain and, you know, they're going to have pain. They just had surgery and they haven't had their pain medication yet. So that's the patient we're going to see last. They're going to get their pain medication. Now, why is that patient not a priority? The patient's not a priority priority because pain never killed anyone. Pain has only killed people in certain situations such as sickle cell crisis, MI, cancer, stones, I'm missing, burns, right? In those five conditions, when it comes to pain, yes, that may be a priority. But outside of that, that's not the first patient we're going to see. So that's why we're seeing the patient last, because there's nothing going on with them, physiologically speaking, that would put their life in danger. 
I hope I explained this in a way that you guys can understand. I definitely plan on doing more case studies. So let me know what you'd like to see me do a case study on. I'll definitely keep them coming. If you guys have any questions about this case study, please sound off in the comment section. I'd love to answer your questions. I can't get to everyone, but I'm going to try my best to answer as many as possible. Guys, thank you so much. Don't forget, check me out. You can find me covering nursing topics across my social media platforms. Almost daily. TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. My handle's the same everywhere. Nexus Nursing. Thank you so much for watching. You guys catch me on the next video.